Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Master Passive Income Show. My name is Dustin Heiner, and I'm here to help you get financial independence, quit that J-O-B, that just overbroke job, and do anything that you want because you are financially independent by investing in real estate. Today, I am super pumped to bring on a friend of mine. She is fantastic at investing, at being a realtor, as well as really just helping people and helping people that are in the military. Just so many great things about this, this lady that is going to come on the show. Her name's Allie Garcet. Allie, thank you so much for being here on the show with us. Dustin, thank you so much for having me. You know what? Actually, I, I should have realized that I should have just drove up to your house. We could have done this in person. We're so close. <laughs> that's a that's a good point. We are that close. Yes. It's so fun. So just thinking about this too. And I, I I've told you this many times, you know this, but everybody has to know this too. So when I was putting on RubeCon, the first thought of the thought of putting on the Real Estate Wealth Builders Conference, I was like, I don't even know if anybody go, is going to come at all. And I thought, let me just go ahead and do it. And I put it out there and said, okay, if anybody wants to buy a ticket, and with it was probably about a couple of days, nobody buying tickets. Like, oh well, it's not happening. And then I got the first sale. The first sale was from Allie. Allie, you were the one that bought the first ticket. And I'm never gonna let that down because it was so encouraging to me. Like, at least one person wants to come. This is so good. And then now you've been helping out with RubeCon as well. Uh, it's just, it's just so fantastic to to see. And we're really close. Like you're uh, in Tucson. I'm in Phoenix. And so it's it's just fun that we're. Ah, it's it's been great. So I'm so glad to be able to yeah. get all of my audience to get to know you. Yeah, no, I mean, I saw, I remember when I saw that, um, I don't know if it was an ad that popped up. I was actually visiting family in New York and I remember that specifically. I was like, oh man, this conference is just up the road. And I have a lot of investor friends in Tucson. Like we can all just carpool together. So yeah, I purchased the ticket and totally not knowing I was the first one. I was like, oh man, I'm late to the game. I better join this one. <laughs> so it was fun. And then that's why I volunteered for the next one. And I'm excited to speak at the at the third one. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I'm I'm super pumped to have you. And all the everything that you've been doing, which we're gonna get into right now. So tell us a little bit about yourself and how like where you started from how you got into investing, you know, what got you to really to want to be a real estate investor. So talk to us a little about you. Yeah. So I, I joined the military. I did ROTC and I commissioned uh, as an officer in 2012, thinking I would mainly just do the four years, get in, get out, finish the, you know, scholarship requirement, but four years turned into a decade. So uh, I was there for a decade when I was, uh, I think at my four year mark, I was in, I was stationed in Colorado, Colorado Springs, and I had, I knew about this VA loan. So I purchased a property. It, it was a condo, which I, I do regret. I wish I had purchased a multifamily, but you live and you learn. You can't live with regret, whatever. I purchased something. What, so, sorry, quickly. What year was that? 2016. Yeah. So I purchased in 2016 and then I actually got short uh, notice deployment orders to Afghanistan a month later. So I rented it out and as I was in Afghanistan, getting my, you know, getting rental checks, I'm like, man, this is not bad. So I did not, that first property was not meant to be an investment. It was, well, obviously it's the VA loan, it's owner occupied. So, uh, but that's kind of like what clicked in my head. I'm like, oh, real estate is kind of cool, but I still wasn't, I don't feel like I was bit by the bug then. Uh, fast forward to like two, three years after that, after, uh, I was not happy in as in my W-2 in the military. I was looking at like the higher ups, the colonels I'd be replacing, the lieutenant colonels I'd be replacing. And they weren't living the life that I had imagined for myself. You know, they were away from their family. They were, I mean, I would have to spend another three years abroad. No, thank you. So especially when this is considered my prime, um, at that point, that is what lit the bug, right? Where where, lit the whatever you call it, whatever the phrase is. <laughs> so that's where I was like, you know what? I really need to ramp up passive income, residual income to be able to separate from my J-O-B to be able to work for myself and live my own life. So that is when I purchased a second property and then a third, fourth. And now I have, my wife and I have a portfolio of uh, eight doors, seven properties. So I eight separated doors, the seven properties. So yep. from 2016, now you have seven properties, eight doors. That is absolutely fantastic. And I, Tell me a little bit about how you can utilize, because everybody listening, if you're in the military and you're not investing with your VA loan, oh my goodness, you like you need to stop everything and start learning how to actively do that because uh, it's such a brilliant way to start investing. And it 
it makes it such an easier way for people who are serving our great country to give them a huge leg up. So talk to us about that yeah. VA loan and how we can actually utilize it. Yes. So you pretty much just have to be in the military for at least 90 days, a very short period. Of course, you have to be in good standing. But 90 days after your service, you qualify for the VA loan, which is amazing. So the major benefit of the VA loan is 0% down payment and no PMI. Because usually with like an FHA or something conventional, with and when you have 0% down payment, they usually catch you with a little bit of a PMI there. So but with the VA loan, that does not happen. And it, of course, it's meant for an owner-occupied residence. So single family condo up to four units, which I suggest uh, purchase a multifamily if you can. And uh, it's it's a no-brainer. You are allowed two out at one time. If you uh, At the same time, if you want to purchase a third property, then you either have to refinance the first one out of the VA loan or sell it. So you can have two houses at 0% with that VA loan. I didn't know that. That's number one. But then it does it ever run out. Like, can you do you ever not be able to let's say you got two refinance one, so you only have one or you refinance both and you have none. Can you like the rest of your life? Can you keep using that VA loan? There is there is a cap. So on your very first property, if you have never used the VA loan, it's uncapped. Pretty much the only requirement there is what the lender sees based off of your DTI, you as a you as a person. So they actually switched that in like 2020, 2021. So therefore military members stationed in high cost of living areas like San Diego, Hawaii wouldn't be priced out. So that way they could still purchase because um, previously there was that VA cap um, where the, if you're living in San Diego, you didn't have enough to purchase. So it would have to be a portion of the VA loan combined with conventional loan. So you'd have to put the down payment on the remainder of the conventional loan. Now the first purchase is uncapped. And then after that, then it goes down to the county limit. So the VA loan per county, you can Google it. Uh, like for example, Pima County is like 547,000-ish. Um, so that's, that's a, it's quite a bit. You know, you can purchase more than one property with that. So whatever the remainder is, that's what you have left over. That makes sense. Okay, so it's a dollar amount total, correct? Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, you were you said you're in the Air Force. So, when you're when you're deployed or when you are actively serving, how do you how do you actively buy a house? live in it because it has to be owner occupied. But then let's say you get moved to someplace else and then buy another one, but then making sure that you're making money from these properties, you know, because once you leave a property, you have to make sure that it gets rented and taken care of and making money. How do you make sure you're going to be doing that? And can you do that over and over again? Let's say you get shipped from one place to another every, every year, year and a half, and you're continually doing it over and over again. What are your thoughts there? Yeah, you bring up a lot of good points that, that I want to uh, mention. So some, some, People say, you know, just purchase everywhere you live. Sometimes you live in very, very not landlord friendly locations. So sometimes that's good if you happen to live in only, you know, the center of the country where it typically is more landlord friendly. Um, it really depends on what your play is. So my first, like I said, but my first condo in Colorado Springs, I hadn't run the numbers because I didn't think of it as an investment because I didn't expect to deploy right away. So luckily... It was sort of ish a break even. I didn't lose out too much, you know. At the end, at the end of the year, I was. It ended up, uh, the numbers working out. I was paying like ninety eight dollars, something like the ninety eight hundred bucks a month to in order to hold it. So I was like, man, real estate, nah, maybe this is not for me. I, I don't really get this thing. <laughs> um, so of course the money is made when you buy, you want to make sure that yes, you're going to be living in it, but if you're going to live in it for one year, at, what is the realistic rent that you're going to be getting for it after you move out? Or if you're purchasing a multifamily, what realistically, like what are the rents doing right now? So that's where you have to make sure that you know how to run your numbers. You're talking to an agent that knows realistically what the rents are. And of course, they're always like, oh, this is the rent right now, but you could you could up it. No, sometimes you can't. Sometimes it's rented at that price because that's what the price is. So uh, yeah, that's. I feel like I, I only answered half of your questions there though. No, no, that, that makes a lot of sense. And then, then once, because you're 100% right, if you're not going to be able to make money after you buy the property in rent, because you're right. Sometimes you can't raise the rents. Maybe they're already as high as they can be 
for that area for that particular property. Uh, and so realtors love to sell properties. That's that's their goal is to sell a property. And hopefully they're going to give you great information, but sometimes they might be mistaken or they might mislead you. I don't know if that's either way, but you have to verify how much money it's going to make every single month. Because if you're buying it, hoping to rent it out, and it turns out you're losing, like you said, $100 or $200 or $500 a month, then you're, it's not an asset. It's a liability. It's just taking money out of your pocket. We don't want that. So I, I love that idea with that. Now, you said something and we skipped over it really quickly, but PMI, because let's say we are buying a house and we're not using FHA loan. We only do an FHA loan, which is three and a half. It's a federal housing administration loan, three and a half percent down, but then you have PMI. Um, I think it's uh, what's principal or private mortgage insurance. Um, and so with the VA loan, you don't have that. Talk to us about that and how tremendous that is because having zero percent down, which is awesome. And then not having extra money come out of your pocket every single month. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, I mean, it, it is truly a no brainer and that's because the government backs the VA loan. So therefore, you know, should you as a person, as a military member, not be able to pay for it, the government is still like, they, they're still backing it. Um, unlike every other person off the street, they have to pretty much say, don't worry, I am paying a premium to be able to get this FHA loan. So they have, and and the numbers still work. I'm not saying that that's like a bad, a bad thing. If the numbers work, then perfect, go for it. So with my first purchase being, you know, VA loan, um, I actually, you know, being that I didn't run the numbers for, for it as an investment property, I lucked out that I had appreciation and boy, did I have some appreciation. I, you know, it's, it really is the saying of just hold on to real estate, like buy real estate and then you wait. Because I realized, had I maybe run numbers and found a property that could make me two hundred, uh, you know, whoop de doo, two hundred dollars a month, uh, that would have been nice. But uh, that property doubled in three years, so I had one hundred and fifty thousand uh, dollars in just straight equity in less than two years of me owning it. And at that point. Now I can use that appreciation and convert that into cash flow. Where if I want to purchase a, you know, a multifamily somewhere else, a little bit more of a landlord friendly state, I can do so. But that significantly helped me to be able to separate from the military after a decade as a millionaire. How do you make sure that the property is going to be taken care of? It's the the tenants are going to be paying their rents. How do you make sure that ongoing after you leave? Because more than likely, if you're deployed to someplace else, you're going to be busy. You're not going to have time to do all What are your suggestions or how would you make sure you're running a business well so you're making money without you actively being there? Super good question, because that's the biggest that's the biggest objection, you know, to, of people getting into real estate. I think it's it's I don't want to manage it. I don't want to be called at midnight and you don't have to for a simple like 10 percent, sometimes eight, sometimes 12. 10% of the rent that you're getting, you can hire a property manager that you have the ability to hire and fire if they mess up. But of course, hopefully you don't want it. You're not in that position. I've been in that position. <laughs> um, and they make it try, they try to make it hard to fire them. But if it's in their contract that they're not doing their half of the contract, you know, it's the contract goes both ways. So, um, but yeah, in, interview property managers, go to your local like realtor, uh, not realtor, real estate investing meetups and ask what what property managers are they using? And as you're Googling them, look at look at the Google reviews. Of course, all the property managers, they all have pretty bad reviews. A lot of those reviews though will be from the tenants saying, hey, they didn't let me pay, let, pay my rent late. That's good. <laughs> That's a good thing that you want. So definitely do your due diligence. Love that. And that's something I give to my students is I say, uh, if you're looking at reviews for property managers, Look at which reviews you're looking at. Like if it's a one star and if somebody says, oh, they I didn't pay my rent for six months and they evicted me. I can't believe they did that. Well, th number one, they should have evicted you a long time ago before that six months. But th those are the type of clientele that we don't want in our properties. And with that, those are the type of people that leave bad reviews. You want to watch out for good reviews that say five stars or four stars. And it's a landlord saying this property manager takes care of my property really, really well. Um, I've looked for lots of other property managers, but these guys do a great job. You want to look for who is actively giving these because there's two different types of reviewers and property managers. If they don't know this, they need to learn it very quickly. They hopefully they do. Most of them do. But you as the landlord, it, you are their 
clients. You are their customer. So when they are looking to who they're going to please, they need to please you because as soon as you take that property from them, they're not going to make any money. The customer is not the tenant. So that's something that you're hundred percent right. I love that. Now, what other ways can a military service member become a millionaire like you had while being in service as well as, I mean, real estate investing, buying, like you said, maybe duplexes, fourplexes, but what are your thoughts? Like how else can we utilize our real estate investing as uh, you know, being a service member? Being a service member, I, I highly, highly believe that if you are in the military, you need your real estate license. Because if you're going to be purchasing and moving across the country every three years, why are you going to pay for an agent to help you? And of course, you know, they say buyers don't pay the commission. You end up paying for it in your monthly cost. <laughs> you know, yes, the seller pays for the off the top, off of the their profit. But what is their profit? The amount that you paid for the house. So um, depending on how long you keep that loan, that's a portion of that was for your realtor. So why not pay yourself and like, you know, why not have access to the MLS and like, look at the properties that you want to purchase, even if you are not realistically say, you know, I'm here right now in Tucson, Arizona, I get orders to my not North Dakota. I'm not going to then like super fast, get my license in North Dakota and know the area, you know, but you can refer yourself to a realtor out there and save on a, a lot of your commission because a typical referral agent to agent is 25, 30%. So if if I'm like, hey, Dustin, you're you're a realtor in Phoenix. I'm a realtor here in Tucson. Can you help me buy a property? It's it's common courtesy, of course. There's a paperwork to paperwork to prove it too. Um, that because I brought you a lead, a client, because you don't have to pay for that advertising, then you you're pretty much giving me 25%. And that's just for you and your own business. You, how many people do you know within your circle, within your unit, your group, your sphere that are PCSing or moving every single year with the average referral check that I'm making is like $3,000. That's pretty average. Like all the way from, you know, $5,000 in California to maybe a thousand dollars in like Alabama for lower prices. The average referral check that I get at a 30% referral is about three grand. How many people do you know that are moving right now? Multiply that times three grand. <laughs> That's, I mean, it's a no brainer. So did you get your realtor's license after you got out? Was it before? Was it hard to do? And the reason, the reason I preach this so much is because I didn't get my license early enough. I got my license uh, during my last year of active duty, knowing that I was going to separate, knowing that hopefully I could become a full-time realtor uh, if things went well, right? Like if I was able to match my military income and if I liked it, uh, check and check. So, um, I, but I wish knowing that it, you're, you're surrounded by people that are moving and what better. And in the beginning, I thought of it as like making a, a making a buck off a friend, but it's not because otherwise they're going to be using realtors that don't speak the military language, don't know what PCSing even means, what it truly entails. And they're not good. You know, like if you know of someone else that is a good agent, you are doing your buddies a service. So um, that's, yeah, I, that's, I truly preach that over and over again. Like if you're in the military, get your license. That's terrific. With being in the service and then once you're getting out how do you figure out how to continually grow your business is it just okay now i got to get a job to you know make ends meet as well as try to invest in real estate or is it a good goal to try to like get re replace all of your income with your income that you make from your properties like what are your thoughts to transition from being in the military to now being an investor out of the military that was something that I struggled with mentally, you know, before I, cause I, I got paid pretty well. I separated as a major. I was making $107,000 a year. I wanted to match that. And in Tucson, looking at other federal jobs, I was not going to get that here in Tucson. So I was like, oh man, I'm going to have to get a pay cut. And, you know, my spouse was like, don't worry. Like I can support us. Like we can make it work. So I I'm very grateful that I, I had that. So, but having to replace your income sounds daunting because you are in a W-2 now, because you've never had to rely on yourself. And as I started do, as I started relying on myself and growing my business, 
that's when you realize, oh my gosh, I can do this. Why did I ever think I had to rely on somebody else? Why did I think that I needed to sit in my butt in the seat in front of my boss? And that way I could maybe get a pay grade, like a pay up, you know, just a promotion. If I work hard enough, if I'm in the in crowd, there's so much bureaucracy that goes along with that. I just love working for myself. And my efforts are directly correlated with the amount of money that I'm making. That's why I'm making three times the amount that I was in the military because I love it, you know, like, it, and it takes, it takes that faith, but it takes that, um, the trial period. So try it while you still have something steady, uh, and do both, you know, do both before you jump from one to the other. I can totally, totally agree with that. And I love how, when you were working for yourself, it changes your mindset in a way that now you're providing value and you're getting paid for 100% of the value that you create or do or make or whatever it is, as opposed to when you're working a job, you're working for somebody else and they get a portion of your value that you're creating. They're not paying you 100% of what you're worth. Like, let's say you're a lawyer and you're working for a firm. Well, they bill more than you get paid because they have to make money. Well, instead, if you're working for yourself, like you're a real estate investor and you put the effort in to buy your first property, then buy your 10th property and you keep growing and going, all that value is put back to you. And then with that, what I love, this is just, it comes back down to the most expensive commodity we can ever spend. And that's time, not money, not uh, literally anything else, because time is the only thing we spend and we can never get any more of. We cannot create any more. It just keeps going. And if you can get that time back in your life to do whatever it is you want, to go wherever you want, to, to literally serve or whatever you want to do with your time, then you can realize that, my goodness, I thought I was so secure with this job. Like you said, Allie, oh, why did I think I was like that I needed this job? I don't actually need it. We're only we only think we need it because that's the only thing we know. Once you get out of that, you realize, my goodness, it's actually so much, my opinion, so much easier than I thought it ever could be because now I have literally 100% of my time going to myself, the value that I'm bringing and being able to provide value to other people. And you're 100% right too. The value that you bring is correlated to how much money you make. If you're not bringing any value to anybody, you're not going to make any money. You need to be able to bring value to people and when you do that, you make money. And it, it's it's so amazing. So as everybody, hopefully they get to that point where they are financially independent, it's going to make life so much better for everybody. Now, Ali, with people that, let's say they're in the military or even out of the military, they want to become a realtor. How would they go about doing it? They just got to take a test, you know, study, take a test and just become a realtor. Like what what is the process to do that? I will say the bar is very, very low. So that's why there are so many <laughs> bad realtors out there. So if you want to, if you want to be a realtor and you have half of a brain with a little bit of discipline, you can go so far. You will, you will surprise yourself. I bet you, if you were to ask your realtor how much money they make, if they were to tell you the truth, it wouldn't be that much. It would not be that much. And that's because a lot of realtors don't have the processes, like the checklist down. They don't realize, like truly, truly realize that they're running a business. So, but to get, to get your license, uh, there's a school depending on, you know, it, wherever you are, wherever you're at, I would say, say you're in Atlanta, Georgia, I would Google real estate school, Atlanta, Georgia. There's typically going to be either an in-person option or a virtual option, sometimes a hybrid, whichever one you like the best do that. Once you pass the school test, then you have to pass the state test and then you're good to go. So, I mean, it co it costs, right? It's not, it's not free. So it'll be like around maybe a 800 bucks, a thousand bucks. Of, of course, areas vary. Um, it'll be a thousand bucks to get, finish a course, get your license. And then it takes about very rough numbers. Of course, I'm very making a huge generalization. It'll take about 1500 bucks a year just to hold on to your license. So again, being that the, my average referral is $3,000, all you'll need is one and then you'll profit. So, and that's like not even related to you purchasing your own properties for yourself and having access to invest for yourself. So that's, that's pretty much it. And we have, we have, so a lot of people, once they get into the business, they feel like they'll need uh, someone to rub shoulders with. I mean, someone's physically in their community, in their zip code that they can ask questions to. 
I thought the same thing when I was in Tucson. I when I was in Tucson, I'm still in Tucson. But when I first got my license, I was like, I don't. I, I'm interviewing all these local brokerages around me, but I didn't find one that was investor minded that had a higher net worth than I did. I wanted to be around people that that could bring me up, you know. Like, so, and that's all, it's, it's all about who you're surrounding yourself with. And they, I didn't find any that truly, truly wanted to retire early and had a plan to, right. They all say everyone wants to retire early, but no, who has a plan? Can you show me your plan? Um, so then I found a group out in like Charlotte, North Carolina, or like the Fayetteville, just North Carolina across the country. I'm in Arizona. And I saw their checklists. I saw their processes. I saw their team trainings. And I was like, this is the group. This is the group. And knowing that I had nobody to rub shoulders with across the country, I still was able to do 20 transactions, you know, match my military income in eight months and now triple it my first year as only being a realtor. It's it. I mean, all you have to do is just have faith in yourself because you have the checklist. Like we give you the checklist and you, especially if you're in the military, you, we know you have the ability to follow a checklist. So all you need to do is just do it. That's it. <laughs> so when you, when you say, investor friendly or being a babe, you're an investor, number one, but then also being a realtor. When I talk to lots of people who want to invest in real estate, or they are already investing in real estate, they're finding realtors, but they don't really know how to find a realtor that speaks the investor language. Like they might get a little bit of the buzzwords and stuff like that, but they don't think like an investor. I know you think like an investor. Lots of realtors do think like investors, but a lot of them don't. Like you said, it's not the the bar is very low to become a realtor. And I say this to all my students. I know realtors get upset at me, but they're a dime a dozen. It's really the, it, anybody can go and get a uh, a realtor's license. Not saying not knocking it because there are great realtors out there and you know, lots of really really good ones. But get one that actually helps yeah, as an investor. How would we find a good? Um, investing realtor? Is it calling up literally every single one until we talk to one that actually sounds like it? Like, what are your thoughts about finding a good investor realtor? Sphere, who who the people in your community know. Um, you know, typically before I even knew what investing truly was, you know, of course I wanted an investor friendly agent, but you can Google it. You know, you can, you can find one that says that they're an investor friendly agent, but do you actually have social proof? You know, they might, they might slap that in the title of their name, but, and then, the, and then you might even ask them, you know, what's your portfolio look like? And they may or may not tell the truth. So the best way to find an agent that you know has the investor mentality is through meetups, through the people that, you know, other realtors that are investors, well, obviously, I guess that's what you're looking for. But other investors, they work with realtors. They're not doing only off-market direct to seller. They work with invest. They work with realtors. So ask them who they recommend and get a couple and and interview a couple. I that's surprise. Well, no, that's not surprising because I I know you. But most realtors would say, do not talk to lots of realtors. Just talk to me. I'm the only person you talk to. Sign a uh, uh what is it? A, a exclusive Closer. exclusive clause. Yeah, it's like. <laughs> A realtor did that to me one time. It was a number of years ago. I've been investing for four or five years. And I had a realtor say, oh, okay, you know, we're, I'm an investor friendly one. And here's a paper you could sign where, um, you know, I'm going to be your exclusive realtor. I'm like, why would I sign that? And she starts trying, oh, because of this, give me all the benefits that are for her. And then I say, yeah. well, okay, <laughs> how about, because you want me to buy every property through you, even ones that I find. You want me to buy it through you, to give it to you, to where you make money. How about every property that you sell, you have to sell it to me? Like you, that, you can't sell it to anybody else, only sell it to me. Would you sign that? No, you wouldn't. So why would I sign that with you? It's just silly. But knowing you're an investor, as well as you're helpful, like you want to help people as opposed to that's the type of person just like me, 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 just like to take it. So there's so much to go around. As long as we're helping each other out, it's it's going to come back in spades. Now, you did say something that kind of sparked my uh, my thought was you said, we have the process. What do you mean by like, we have the process? Is it like you have uh, coaching yourself? Like, do you get people that work with you that if you if they want to become realtors that you would be able to help them out as well? Yeah. So any, any realtor that joins our community by we, I mean, our upline, right? Like my sponsor, my sponsor, sponsor with, we're with eXp Realty. So it, in case you don't know that model, anybody that I were to sponsor in, I am financially incentivized to help them because out of every commission, every closing that they make, I get a portion of it. And it doesn't come out of that agent's 
uh, portion. It comes out of the, the broker's portion. So at no cost to them, they get free coaches. So we have entire like video series taking them like by from the very beginning of how to find a buyer, how to find a seller to get them under contract through the contract, the close, the follow up, because hopefully that one client will become a repeat client if you follow up enough. Uh, but we have, I mean, the canned emails, because this is a business, you don't want to be recreating the wheel every time. It's, it is, that is what helped me, you know, that's what helped me. And then I like revamped it even more. So now every single buyer that I meet with, you know, and seller that I meet with, it's, it's the same process every time. And you mentioned, you know, having the interview, I actually just got off of a call two hours ago with an investor, uh, investor client, well, not a client, investor, potential client. And I, I told her to interview around. I asked her, how many other agents are you talking to? And you said that you're going to get, you know, a pre-approval through Navy Federal and that Navy Federal came with a, with an agent. Have you spoken to them? Talk to them, you know, cause I, I, there is so much business to go around the last, like people can feel it when you're like, when you come off being like, work with me, work with me. And that doesn't make them want to work with you. They realize that you are desperate. There is so much business if you just talk to people and give. The more you give, the more it will come back. And, and if you haven't realized that yet, it's because you haven't given enough. Like give and it will come back. I love that. 100% agree. And that was one of the big reasons why I asked you to, to help out with RubeCon. You offered. And I was like, you know what? I like Allie. Let's bring her on. She's super helpful and super uh, just a, a giving person. So I know that it, with with being a realtor, being an investor, there's so much to learn, especially being a realtor. I'm not a realtor. I don't, re I don't really want to ever. I just like, eh, I'll leave that to people who want to do that. They could definitely do that. But I know people would. Now, how can people reach out to you? How can they find you? And if they want to become a realtor as well and learn from you, which if if anybody, if you're listening to this, you definitely should reach out to Allie. But Allie, how can people find you? You also have a podcast. So I want you to plug that because I want people to listen to your podcast as well. Thank you so much. Yeah, I have a uh, an, uh, an agent podcast called The Agent Goldmine. That's for realtors, you know, where we interview other realtors that are killing it. And we go deep, like tactical, like what button do you press in order to get these clients, you know, very deep. Um, so, but if you want to get in, in contact with me, I'm Allie, the agent on all social media now to include threads, the newest social media, <laughs> and that's Allie spelled A L I. We have uh, realtor trainings that are open to the public. Like you don't even need to have your license yet. So if you want to join, message me on Instagram on wherever really, but Instagram is typically where I live. <laughs> so Allie, the agent, and it's every Thursday morning, I can give you the link. You can just pop on by, be a fly on the wall and see if you like our community again, because we don't want agents to come in and then realize that they don't like it. I don't know why they wouldn't. I mean, granted, I'm biased. We give you everything. All you need to do is just go. But for some reason, if they don't like it, then that's okay. We, at least we didn't waste each other's time. So it's, it's open to the public. Totally. And your podcast, you have it with Shelby, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So Shelby's a sweetheart too. And I think it's uh, fantastic. Everybody should be uh, definitely checking out your guys' podcast. What was a podcast one more time? Podcast is called, oh, I was about to say Allie the Agent. It's not, <laughs> it's called The Agent Goldmine. We actually like just did a rebranding. So that's, that's a new name, The Agent Goldmine. We should be on everywhere to include YouTube. But yeah, we, I do it with Shelby Johnson. She's awesome. She's the best. Very cool. Allie, so fantastic having you on the show. Have you be a part of RubeCon speaking next year at RubeCon 24 is going to be fantastic. And you also helping out lots of people. So it's been terrific having you on the show. I really appreciate you. Thank you, Dustin. Nice seeing you.